Good day, mates. It's different times around the world, but I'm very happy to be here with you. I'm coming from Seattle, Washington, some 8,000 miles or 13,000 kilometers away, but we're enjoying fellowship as if we were with you in person. Our class ends their love. This is what our meetings look like in this year of COVID-19. I'd like to introduce you to them on the top row, starting from the left and moving right, our brother Dave and sister Joanna Christensen, sister Charlotte Chatelaine from Sandy, Oregon, about 180 miles south of Seattle, sister Lori Flynn and myself. On the bottom, starting from the left, it's my wife's sister, Margie, with our son, Jonathan, and his children, Kennedy and Jackson. And we have brother Tim Krupa. Sister Dawn Krupa is also in our class, but she was working when we took this picture. They live in Cannon Beach, Oregon, which is on the Pacific Ocean, some 200 miles south of Seattle. And finally, we have brother Mike and sister Kathy Ensley, and they live in Colfax, Washington, which is about 300 miles east of Seattle on the Washington-Idaho border. So you can see our class is very spread out. But we have wonderful meetings together. We're looking forward to um, getting back together in person. And our class wanted to send two verses to you this weekend. The first verse, is from Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And we chose this because it's our kingdom theme text for the last 20 years. Uh, we chose this because it's simple and it's powerful to those who seek joint airship with him in the next age. The second verse that we send are Paul's words from Ephesians 3, 17 to 19 that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Brother Darren, is there an echo on your end? Or Brother Ray? Hi, uh, you're coming through fine. Okay, I'm getting feedback on my end. Our subject today is the body of Christ. And the Apostle Paul has much to say about our fellowship in this body during the gospel age. And we hope our thoughts today might heighten the appreciation of our fellowship. Most of our thoughts today will be taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 13 using the Phillips translation. But we begin with Paul's illustration of the body members in his treatment of the memorial emblems discussed in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, where he says in the King James Version, the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? As Bible students, we read this verse each year during our memorial studies. And we know that the word communion used here is better translated, the participation of. I appreciate the explanation of this verse given by Brother Russell in the expanded uh, biblical comments, which he says, both the cup and bread were used to point out our participation with Jesus, not as ransoms, but merely as joint sacrificers with him. Speaking of the cup, he says it is one cup, though it contains the juice of many grapes. The grapes cannot maintain themselves as grapes if they would constitute the life-giving spirit. Speaking of the bread, he says, it is one loaf, though made from many grains. The grains cannot retain their individuality, their life, if they would become the bread of the world. 
think this is a beautiful picture of the body members of Christ giving up their individuality in favor of uniformity with all other body members our joints, as joint sacrificers with Jesus. But Paul speaks of the body members of Christ very differently in the two chapters we're about to consider, where each member does maintain their individuality. We might say that these chapters are more of the joint participation we have with each other, other than, other than Jesus. While he is still the head of the body, the emphasis is upon our fellowship with each other and how each of us has a duty to support each other in our Christian walk. As an overview of Paul's teachings in this, these two chapters, we're gonna focus on these four points as they apply to the church during the gospel age. Number one, every member of the body of Christ receives a spiritual gift or gifts. Number two, the purpose of these gifts is to edify the body. Number three, every member has equal importance. And number four, fruits are better than gifts. We begin by reading 1 Corinthians 12, verses 1 through 7. Now I want to give you some further information in some spiritual matters. You have not forgotten that you were Gentiles following dumb idols, just as you have been taught. Now I want you to understand as Christians that no one speaking by the Spirit of God could call Jesus accursed, and no one could say that he is the Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Men have different gifts, but it is the same Spirit who gives them. There are different ways of serving God, but it is the same Lord who was served. God works through different men in different ways, but it is the same God who achieves his purposes through them all. Each man is given his gift by the spirit that he may make the most of it. Now, these verses lead us to point number one. Every member of the body of Christ receives spiritual gift or gifts. By way of introduction, Paul reminds them as Gentiles, they once followed dumb idols. This word dumb is the same word found in Acts 8.32 concerning Jesus' silence before Pilate, which reads, the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shear, so opened he not his mouth. Paul's point here is simple. The idols Christendom are voiceless, dumb, but the Holy Spirit, the influencing power of God, gives voice to the things God would have us know. Paul says plainly that we all receive spiritual gifts, and there are different ways of serving God, but these all come from the same source, and that is through the leading of the Holy Spirit. Paul's assurance that every member of the body of Christ receives a spiritual gift should be a very consoling thought to the body members of Christ. How many of those who were called have doubted that they have any spiritual gift? How many of those who were called have doubted that they are worthy of such a gift? How many of those who were called have echoed the words of the centurion spoken unto Jesus when asking for his servant to be healed when he said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. Paul had previously explained to these same brothers how they understood the mystery of God with these familiar words in 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has, through the Spirit, let us share his secret. This early church at Corinth had a basic understanding of the operation of the Holy Spirit. But Paul wants to give them more information in some spiritual matters. He tells them there are different gifts. There are different ways of serving God. 
and God works through different men in different ways, but each is given a gift by the Holy Spirit. Each one gathered this weekend at this convention has been given some spiritual gift through the Holy Spirit. Verse 7 says, each man is given his gift by the Spirit that he may make the most of it. So I think it's very appropriate for us to ask ourselves, what is my gift? Is it the gift of witnessing or is it the gift of being a good listener? Is it the gift of study or is it the gift of service? We should make a priority to identify the spiritual gift that we've been given and then look for ways to make the most of it within the body of Christ. This leads us to point number two. The purpose of these gifts is to edify the body. We continue in 1 Corinthians 12, reading verses 11, 8 through 11. One man's gift by the Spirit is to speak with wisdom, another's to speak with knowledge. The same Spirit gives to another man faith, to another the ability to heal, to another the power to do great deeds. The same Spirit gives to another man the gift of preaching the word of God, to another the ability to discriminate in spiritual matters, to another speech in different tongues. But all these gifts is the operation of the same Spirit, who distributes to each individual as he wills. We note first the inclusion of some miraculous gifts like healing, working of miracles, speaking in tongues, and prophesying. In the absence of written teachings and historical background, these were an important part in establishing the early church. Jews relied on the law of the prophets, but the new Christian churches had neither. They had only the miracles and the gospel preached first by Jesus and then by the apostles. These miraculous gifts were important evidences of their new faith. We note also the gifts to speak with wisdom and to speak with knowledge. There's a difference between wisdom and knowledge, and it's important to the edification of the body. Without doubt, both are important, but the gift of knowledge carries with it the potential, and we stress potential, to edify self rather than the body. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 8, 1, we should remember that while knowledge may make a man look big, it is only love that can make him grow to his full stature. Or in the more familiar words of King James, knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifies. A synonym for knowledge is dates, numbers, facts, people, and events. Even scripture, it's, it's data. By comparison, wisdom has to do with the application of knowledge, which makes it more valuable. A practical definition of the difference between the two is found in this illustration. It is knowledgeable to know that a tomato is a fruit, but it takes wisdom to not put it into a fruit salad. We compare the rest of these verses to Ephesians 4, 11, and 12, where Paul says his gifts to men were varied. Some he made his messengers, some prophets, some preachers of the gospel. To some he gave power to guide and teach people. His gifts were made that Christians might be properly equipped for their service, that the whole body might be built up. Peter also speaks about the responsibility to glorify God through service to the body in 1 Peter 4, verses 10 and 11. Serve one another with the particular gifts God has given each of you as faithful dispensers of the magnificently varied grace of God. If any of you is a preacher, then he should preach his message as from God. And if whatever way a man serves the church, he should do it recognizing the fact that God gives him the ability so that God may be glorified in everything through Jesus Christ. Realizing our spiritual gifts are for the edifying of the body of Christ rather than ourselves is summarized beautifully 
in these familiar words of 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 29. Or look at your own callings as Christians, my brothers. You don't see among you many of the wise, according to this world's judgment, nor many of the ruling class, nor many from the noblest families. But God has chosen what the world calls foolish to shame the wise. He has chosen what the world calls weak to shame the strong. He has chosen things of little strength and small repute, yes, and even things which have no real existence to explode the tensions of things that are, that no man may boast in the presence of God. The purpose of our spiritual gifts is to edify the body and not ourselves. Verse 11 says, behind all these gifts is the operation of the same spirit who distributes to each individual man as he wills. We find that there is a unity in the gifts of the spirit because it is the Holy Spirit that distributes all of them. As body members of Christ, we should be willing and able to discuss all spiritual matters with each other in an edifying manner. But there is a human tendency to sometimes speak of things we know the whole body does not agree on. We need to remember the scriptures that instruct us to resist such temp tendency, like the one in Hebrews 10, 22 to 25. And just as an aside, I'm going to mention, this is the sixth time this scripture has been mentioned this weekend. In this confidence, let us hold on to the hope that we profess without the slightest hesitation, for he is utterly dependable, and let us think of one another and how we can encourage each other to love and do good deeds. And let us not hold aloof from our church meetings, as some do. Let us do all we can to help one another's faith, and this the more earnestly as we see the final day drawing ever nearer. And this from 1 Thessalonians 5.11, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another. In an environment of such varied and miraculous gifts, we turn to Paul's teaching on the importance of church, wor church worship among body members found in 1 Corinthians 14, 26. Well then, my brothers, whenever you meet, let everyone be ready to contribute a psalm, a piece of teaching, a spiritual truth, or a tongue with an interpreter. Everything should be done to make your church strong in the faith. For as Kurt King James said, that all things be done unto Ephraim. Having established that each member receives a spiritual gift for the purpose of edifying all members, Paul leads us logically to point three. Every member has equal importance. Paul's illustration of the body in verses 12 to 30 is a perfect extension of his description of the unity of the gifts of the Spirit. He points out different parts of the body, foot, hand, ear, the eye, and makes the determination that the body is dependent upon all of them working together. Two pieces of evidence show all body members have equal importance. The first evidence is that God has decided it to be this way. Verses 22 to 25 says, God has arranged all the parts in the one body according to his design. For if everything were concentrated in one part, how could there be a body at all? The fact is there are many parts, but only one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Nor again can the head say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body which have no obvious function are the more essential to health. And to those parts of the body which seem to us to be less deserving of notice, we have to allow the highest honor function. The parts which do not look beautiful have a deeper beauty in the work they do while the parts which look beautiful may not be at all essential to life. But God has harmonized the whole body 
by giving importance of function to the parts which lack apparent importance, that the body should work together as a whole with all the members in sympathetic relationship with, with one another. In short, God has leveled the playing field when it comes to each member of the body of Christ. Second, God has made suffering and honor among the body parts mutually dependent. Verse 26 says, so it happens that if one member suffers, all the other members suffer with it. And if one member is honored, all the members share a common joy. Each one of you, dear brethren, has equal importance to every other member of the body of Christ because God has arranged it this way. Most of you have been to multiple virtual conventions this year and listened into testimony meetings and fellowship and chat rooms. And we've listened to brother we may have met for maybe just the first time in a different part of the world. And they've shared personal trials in their lives. And we've all received encouragement from other fellow body members. Can you imagine anyone in the body of Christ hearing an experience of a brother or sister and dismissing them as unimportant? That'd be like foot kicking a large stone and the whole body not limping. This is such a beautiful illustration of every body member of Christ having equal importance with the others. This brings us to point number four. Fruits are better than gifts. Verse 31 is a transition point in Paul's discourse. You should set your hearts on the highest spiritual gifts, but I will show you what is the highest way of all. The brethren at Corinth seemed to be attracted to the more sensual, sensational things. They probably coveted the more miraculous gifts like healing, working of miracles, speaking in tongues, and prophesying. But Paul says these have no future in the gospel age church. In 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 to 10, he says, For if there are prophecies, they will be fulfilled and done with. If there are tongues, the need for them will disappear. If there is knowledge, it will be swallowed up in truth. For our knowledge is always incomplete, and our prophecy is always incomplete. And when the complete comes, that is the, the incomplete. Paul will spend the entire 14th chapter teaching the proper way to use these spiritual gifts in their meeting. But first he says he will show them a more excellent way. Typical of his logical way of teaching, Paul first eliminates the most coveted gifts in the first three verses of 1 Corinthians from the ESV. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not up, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. The reason these gifts become hollow is the fact they are gifts. There's no earning power in receiving a gift. You don't get any better as a person when you receive a gift. You just get more stuff. Any honor belongs to the giver, not the receiver. Paul is about to explain why anything developed in ourselves and worked for is far more valuable than something received as a gift. The New Testament consistently lays out our need to develop the fruit of the Spirit rather than rely on gifts from God. Peter says we might be partakers of the divine nature if we develop faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, enduring patience, devotion to God, brotherliness, and Christian love. That's 2 Peter 2, 4-8. 
Paul says the same in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, saying, the spirit, however, produces in human life fruits such as these, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, fidelity, tolerance, and self-control. And no law exists against any of them. And so to remove any doubt that fruits are better than gifts, the Apostle John says this, John 15, 8, again in the ESV. By this, my father is glorified, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. I think there's an interesting parallel between the miraculous gifts of the Spirit present in the establishment of the early church and its reemergence at the beginning of the harvest of the gospel age. The term full gospel was first coined by an aspiring evangelist named A.B. Simpson around 1881 and was claimed to be a return to the doctrines and power of the apostolic age. Today, full gospel churches can be found around the world. Could it be possible that the adversary arranged this timing in an effort to confuse those who were searching for the truth at the time of our Lord's second advent? I leave that for your discussion. To us, it is clear that the body of Christ is not to be developed through miraculous gifts of the spirit, but by developing a Christ-like character. In verse 13, Paul lists the most important of all spiritual gifts. In this life, we have three great lasting qualities, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of them is love. Love is the greatest of the three because it is the one that lasts forever. Our studies on faith and hope are extremely profitable in our Christian walk, but each still points forward to the coming kingdom. Both will, both will fade away when the reality of the kingdom arrives. Brother Russell expresses this point well in reprint 4444, where he writes, we shall always need to have love if we abide in divine favor. As for faith and hope, excellent qualities though they may be, the time will come when they will be swallowed up by sight, by fruition, by the actualities of the glorious condition of fellowship with the Lord. But love will never fail. Among all the graces of the Spirit, it stands supreme and eternal. It has been said that love cannot be defined in words. It can only be defined by its actions. Paul defines them this way in verses four through seven, with words often speaking in wedding services. This love of which I speak is slow to lose patience. It looks for a way of being constructive. It is not possessive. It is neither anxious to impress, nor does it cherish inflated ideas of its own importance. Love has good fears and does not pursue selfish advantage. It is not touchy. It does not keep account of evil or gloat over the wickedness of other people. On the contrary, it is glad with all good men when truth prevails. Love knows no limit to its endurance, no end to its trust, no fading of its hope. It can outlast anything. It is, in fact, the one thing that still stands when all else has fallen. The principle taught by Paul in the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians is that we keep our individuality as joint sacrificers with each other in the body of Christ. Let the fruits of the Spirit guide our behavior in the body of Christ as expressed in these few examples. Galatians 6.10 Let us then do good to all men as opportunity offers, especially to those who belong to the Christian household. Romans 12, 9 and 10. Let us have temptation, Christian love. Let us have a genuine break from evil and a real devotion to good. Let us have real warm affection for one another as between brothers and a willingness to let the other man have the credit. Ephesians 4, 
1 and 2. As God's prisoner, then, I beg you to live lives worthy of your high calling. Accept life with humility and patience, making allowances for each other because you love each other. Romans 15, verses 1 through 3. We who have strong faith ought to shoulder the burden of the doubts and qualms of others, and not just to go our own sweet way. Our actions should mean the good of others, should help them to build up their characters. For even Christ did not choose his own pleasure, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell me. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Let there be no more resentment, no more anger or temper, no more violent self-assertiveness, no more slander, and no more malicious remarks. Be kind to each other. Be understanding. Be as ready to forgive others as God, for Christ's sake, has, forgot, has forgiven you. John 13, 34, 35. Now I am giving you a new command. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, so you must love one another. This is how all men will know that you are my disciples, because you have such love for one another. And finally, Colossians 3, 12 through 13. As therefore God's picked representatives of the new huma humanity, purified and beloved of God himself, be merciful in action, kindly in heart, humble in mind. Accept life and be most patient and tolerant with one another, always ready to forgive. <coughs> Excuse me. If you have a difference with anyone, forgive as freely as the Lord has forgiven you. And above everything else, be truly loved, for love is the golden chain of all virtues. So let us summarize our thoughts on the body of Christ. First, every member of the body of Christ receives a, spirit, a spiritual gift through the power of the Holy Spirit. That includes every one of you attending this convention. Each one of us should do our best to identify our gift and seek to make the most of it among those of like precious faith. Second, the purpose of these gifts is to edify the body. All the apostles take this message for the good of the entire church. Make sure you aren't tempted to edify yourself through carelessness or a measure of pride. Third, God designed the body of Christ in a particular way to make sure each member has equal importance, including every one of us at this convention. Never doubt the important role you play in making the body complete and perfect. Fourth, miraculous gifts were important in establishing the early church, but they had an expiration date as the church became established with the recorded words of the New Testament. To make our calling election sure, we must be more Christ-like by developing the fruits of the Spirit. Let the lessons and fellowship of this weekend be a reminder that God demands fruit bearing in our Christian lives as we seek to develop a character more in the image of Jesus. Brethren, let this weekend of convention blessings teach each other in your hearts and prayers, remembering these two verses. 1 John 4, 10, 11. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And John 15, 13, 14. There is no greater love than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I tell you to do. And let us remember that God's plan for mankind has been and continues to be progressive. We are privileged to know the mystery of God where others that have come before us have not. 
1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 8 says, We do, of course, speak wisdom among those who are spiritually mature, but it is not what is called wisdom by this world, nor by the powers that be, who soon will only be the powers that have been. The wisdom we speak of is that mysterious secret wisdom of God, which he planned before the creation for our glory today. None of the powers of this world have known this wisdom. If they had, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. <clears throat> Paul tells us the faithful ancient worthies did not know, but they will after the body of Christ is completed and glorified. Hebrews 11, 39 and 40. And these all have obtained a good report through faith, receive not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. And he tells us it was the same with Israel, God's chosen people living under the strict provisions of the law covenant. He tells the Jewish converts of Galatia in Galatians 3, 23 to 25. Before the coming of faith, we were all imprisoned under the power of the law with our only hope of deliverance, the faith that was to be shown to us, or to change the metaphor, the law was like a strict governess in charge of us until we went to the school of Christ and learned to be justified by faith in him. Once we had that faith, we were completely free from the governess's authority. Like the ancient worthies, Israel was also to have this revealed and be blessed after the body of Christ is completed and glorified. <clears throat> Romans 11, 25 to 27 reads, Now I don't want you, my brothers, to start imagining things, and I must therefore share with you my knowledge of God's secret plan. It is this, that the partial insensibility which has come to Israel is only to last until the full number of the Gentiles has been called in. Once this has happened, all Israel will be saved. As the scripture says, the deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. All of God's faithful ones recorded in the Old Testament sought for a promised kingdom on earth. So they looked for a mighty Messiah to lead them to the promised land. And they also looked for the best way to reach that goal, relying on, relying on the, most, uh, the best resources that man possessed in their day. In an account recorded in 1 Kings 3, 5 to 15, God appeared before a young Solomon in a dream and said, ask what you wish me to give you. Well, Solomon wished to rule Israel as well as his father David had done. And so he answered by saying, I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out and come in. Your servant is in the midst of your people, which you have chosen, a great people who are too many to be numbered or counted. So give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people, to discern between good and evil. It was pleasing in the sight of the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. God said to him, because you have asked this thing, and have not asked for yourself long life, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have you asked for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself discernment to understand justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. Behold, I have given you a wise and discerning heart, so that there has been no one like you before, nor shall one like you shall arise after you. This account shows God's approval of Israel's desire to live up to their covenant with him according to their promise to do so at Mount Sinai. Living with earthly hopes before the gospel was revealed through the Holy Spirit to the body of Christ, Solomon's advice to us would probably be to get wisdom. In Proverbs 4, 7, he even told us, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all thy getting, get understanding. But as Paul taught the brethren at Corinth, 
the body of Christ is to seek after the highest way of all, the way of love. The most miraculous gifts given to the early church will fade away when the reality of the kingdom comes. But love will forever be a requirement to obtain everlasting life. We read in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 12 and 13, at present, we are men looking at puzzling reflections in a mirror. The time will come when we shall see reality full and face to face. At present, all I know is a little fraction of the truth, but the time will come when I shall know it as fully as God now knows me. In this life, we have three great lasting qualities, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of them is love. <clears throat> it's not surprising that Brother Russell wrote three full articles on 1 Corinthians 13, focusing on the greatest quality required of the body of Christ. It's also not surprising that he gave this advice to those seeking first the kingdom of God in reprint 2205. Let us, dear readers, with all our getting, get love, not merely in word, but in deed and in truth. The love whose roots are in the new heart, begotten in us by our Heavenly Father's love, exemplified in the words and deeds of our dear Redeemer. All else sought and gained will be but loss and dross unless we all secure love. Yes, dear brother, each of us as individual members of the body of Christ has something to give each of the other members. And remember, God placed you in the body exactly where it pleased him. Embrace his choice in the matter for yourself and all others. And whenever there may be envy, jealousy, bitterness, contention, or any conflict with any of your brothers and sisters, let love overrule to the highest degree. We all have our own character to contend with, but our freedom should uh, be to love one another lest we harm one another. Paul warned of this in Galatians 5, 13 to 15, saying, It is to freedom that you have been called, my brothers. Only be careful that freedom does not become mere opportunity for your lower nature. You should be free to serve each other in love. For after all, the whole law towards others is summed up by this one command. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But a freedom means merely that you are free to attack and tear each other to pieces, be careful that it doesn't mean that between you, you destroy your fellowship together. <clears throat> For you see your brethren caller, you see your calling brother, how you were called into the body of Christ. Amen and may the Lord add his blessing. <clears throat>